Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Luigi Pirandello's play, Six Characters in Search of an Author. This is one of the great absurdist plays. Uh, Pirandello was uh, an important Italian playwright and, and author, and uh, Six Characters in Search of an Author really depends a lot on sort of meta theater. That is, a theater that is aware of itself and presents itself as theatrical. Um, and what it, the reason it does this is to interrogate the very ideas of making theater and of storytelling as such. So the play opens, we start, the place uh, is listed as the stage of a playhouse. And indeed, a stage is where all of the action occurs. The play opens with um, a technician, a stagehand, uh, somebody like this, coming in and starting to build set, build build sets. Um, right in the theater. In, in the theater at the time uh, that this play came out, mid twentieth century or so, um, a lot of theatrical scenery was still very much old school. A lot of canvas, uh, painted canvas backdrops and things like this, you used wooden props to hold things up. In some theaters, that's still true. Some theaters have moved on to more sort of technologically advanced stuff. But we have this opening bit where we see the actual sort of process of construction that goes into making the scenery of a play. So that's our first bit of meta theater. This this very clear indication that this is a play aware of itself as a play. What we're seeing here is the process that goes into making a play. And we see that right from the very first actions on stage. Then we have uh, the stage manager and the director come in. Um, we get the actors coming in, etc., etc., and a lot of them are these very sort of stereotypical, stereotypical actors, really. Um, like the leading lady, who's this sort of diva who's always late, but um, is also unwilling to be criticized for being late, etc., etc. And these are very traditional theater roles, going back to again old school type theater. Um, we have the leading lady, the leading man, the second actress, the ingenue, the juvenile lead. These are traditional kinds of roles. And so they come in, they are, they are starting to set up, and we get this other bit of meta-criticism, poking fun actually at Pirandolo himself, because they're working on this play. Um, Let me see if I can find the title of the play that they're working on is not super super important, but let me see if I can find it. Oh, it's uh, the game of role playing. Uh, so that's the the play that they're theoretically supposed to be working on. We don't really get much information about it, but. Um, at one point, the leading actor challenges one of the lines in the script. He says, but it's ridiculous, if I may say so. And the director, leaping to his feet furious, says, ridiculous? Delic ridiculous? What do you want me to do? We never get a good play from France anymore, so we're reduced to producing plays by Pirandolo. A fine man and all that, but neither the actors, the critics, nor the audience are ever happy with his plays. And if you ask me, he does it all on purpose. The actors laugh, and now he rises and comes over to the leading actor, shouts, A cook's hat! Yes, my dear man, and you beat eggs. And you think you have nothing more on your hands than the beating of eggs? Guess again, you symbolize the shell of those eggs. The actors resume their laughing and start making ironical comments among themselves. Silence, and pay attention while I explain, again addressing himself to the leading actor. Yes, the shell, that is to say, the empty form of reason without the content of instinct, which is blind. You are reason, and your wife is instinct in the game of role-playing. You play the part assigned to you, and you're your own puppet, of your own free will, understand? 
the leading actor, extending his arms, palms upward. Me? No. The director returning to his place. Nor do I. Let's go on. So, so we have two elements of metacriticism here. One is the actual poke at Pirandolo himself by himself. Uh, this, this critique of Pirandolo as a playwright, but also this critique of audiences and critics who don't maybe fully grasp Pirandolo's work in the way that he thinks that they should. But then we've also got this meta-analysis of the play. And this is actually something directors do. This is something that dramaturgs do. I, I've worked as a dramaturg, and one of the things that we do is try and explain the symbolism of things. Uh, sometimes this job does fall to a director. But this idea that the eggs are not just eggs. The eggs represent something larger, a thematic element in the play, etc., etc. This is, again, a metacritical component where the play is pointing us to the fact that it doesn't just mean what's on stage. There are larger meanings at work here. So then we get this entrance of a set of characters. Um, and the characters are interesting. The, the, the characters themselves are somewhat generic, like in terms of the cast list for them. We have the father, the mother, the son aged 22, the stepdaughter 18, the boy 14, the little girl 4. Then later we get Madame Pache, but she doesn't stay for very long. Um, and the boy and the little girl don't speak. So we've got these very generic characters in a family grouping. But what it says about their entrance here, this is a bit of the stage directions. There's a lot more description of them and, and their entrance. But one of the things it says that's really interesting is, the most suitable and effective means to be suggested here is the use of special masks for the characters. Masks specially made of material which doesn't go limp when sweaty, and yet masks which are not too heavy for the actors wearing them, cut out and worn so that they leave eyes, nostrils, and mouth free. This will also bring out the inner significance of the play. The characters, in fact, should not be presented as ghosts, but as created realities, unchanging constructs of the imagination, and therefore more solidly real than the actors with their fluid naturalness. The masks will help to give the impression of figures constructed by art, each one unchangeably fixed in the expression of his own fundamental sentiment. And so that's who these characters are. Um, they represent their own true experiences as fictional constructs. So these are not actors. These are not human beings. These are characters in the true sense of the word. They have been created by an author who then denies them life, denies them their story, denies them the ability to be who they are. And so they go in search of another author who will let them tell their story via that author's pen. The the stepdaughter and the father, who are the, the two uh, characters who try the most to explain to the director what they are and what they require, uh, the stepdaughter says uh, to the director, going right up to the director, smiling coquettishly, believe me, we really are our six characters, sir. Very interesting ones at that but lost, adrift. And then the father, brushing her aside, says, very well, lost, adrift, going right on. In the sense that, uh, in the sense, that is, that the author who created us, made us live, did not wish, or simply and materially was not able to place us in the world of art. And that was a real crime, sir, because whoever has the luck to be born a living character can also laugh at death. He will never die. The man will die, the writer, the instrument of creation, the creature will never die. And to have eternal life, it doesn't even take extraordinary gifts, nor the performance of miracles. Who was Sancho Panza? Who was Don Abondio? 
but they live forever because, as live germs, they have the luck to find a fertile matrix, an imagination which knew how to raise and nourish them, make them live through all eternity. So essentially, these characters came to life because the author imagined them. The author brought them into being, but didn't tell the story. And so the characters are now trying to to reverse engineer their story almost. They're trying to, to get this story told so that they can have the life that they were meant to have. And they're trying to use this company of actors to do it. The problem is that unlike even an author who some authors are more flexible than others about what sorts of changes they will allow to their materials. But what Six Characters in Search of an Author does, what Perondolo does in this play, is essentially imagine if the characters had artistic control over the story, what kind of truth would they insist on from the actors? And so that becomes one of the big sticking points in this play. The characters talk through and sometimes act out their story, and then the actors attempt to represent the story in an artistic manner, which is not necessarily the way that the characters experienced it. Um, and so that becomes a big point of contention, the distinction between truth and fiction, or the distinction between reality, the characters as reality, which is an interesting construct in, in itself, but reality versus art, reality versus theater or performance. So we get, for instance, this, this discussion. Um, the father and the stepdaughter are critiquing some of the director's ideas about how to actually put this story on stage. And the father says, what is expressed in us? The director cuts him off, expression, expression. You think that's your business? Not at all. The father says, well, but what we express. The director says, but you don't. You don't express. You provide us with raw materials. The actors give it body and face, voice and gesture. And then a little bit later, the director says, oh, for heaven's sake, you can't exist here. Here the actor acts you and that's that. The father says, I understand, sir, but now perhaps I begin to guess also why our author, who saw us, alive as we are, did not want to put us on stage. I don't want to offend your actors, God forbid, but I feel that seeing myself acted, I don't know by whom. The leading man, rising with dignity and coming over, followed by the gay young actresses who laugh. By me, if you've no objection. The father, humble and smooth, I'm very honored, sir, he bows. But however much art and willpower the gentleman puts into absorbing me into himself, he's bewildered now, the leading man says, finish, finish. The actresses laugh. The father says, well, the performance he will give, even forcing himself with makeup to resemble me, well, with that figure, all the actors laugh, he can hardly play me as I am. I shall rather be, even apart from the face, what he interprets me to be, as he feels I am, if he feels I am anything, and not as I feel myself inside myself. And this actually comes up later on. We get this in a number of, of instances where the actors try and perform the story that's being told, um, and then the, the, uh, the characters are amused or insulted or not fully on board with the, the way that the actors bring this to life. So, for instance, um, there's a scene where... The mother, the mother, the stepdaughter, and the two younger children. Okay, so the story that the characters tell is a slightly odd one. The mother and the father have gotten married. Uh, the son is born. He's somewhat distant initially, but he becomes more distant later on. Uh, the mother falls in love with another guy. And the father basically says, all right, you're going to go marry. You're going to go marry, cohabitate with that guy. Uh, they have 
They have, uh, I think the, the two younger children at least are theirs. I think the stepdaughter is maybe theirs. I don't remember exactly. Anyway, um, so they're off in poverty. The father is sort of keeping tabs on them. Well, they're off in relative poverty. They're not doing fantastic. They're not doing terrible. Then the other guy dies, and they are the family is thrown into proper poverty. Uh, the mother becomes a seamstress for Madame Pache, uh, but the stepdaughter, the the Madame Pache continually says that the mother has ruined the material she gave her. So the stepdaughter basically has to work as a prostitute in order to make up that debt. The father unknowingly comes into the brothel and there's different versions of the story. The stepdaughter suggests they actually had sex. The father suggests they did not because he recognized her in time, etc., etc. But then he brings them back into the house, etc., etc. There's this whole thing. Um, and so they play this scene where the father comes into the brothel to hire the stepdaughter, again, not knowing that it's her. Um, and they've they, the characters have played this somewhat awkward scene of them both being somewhat uncomfortable. And then we get this performance by the leading man. Um, <clears throat> so it says, the door at the back opens and the leading man comes forward with the relaxed, waggish manner of an elderly Don Juan. From the first speeches, the performance of the scene by the actors is quite a different thing, without, however, having any element of parody in it. Rather, it seems corrected, set to rights. Naturally, the stepdaughter and the father being quite unable to recognize themselves in this leading lady and leading man, but hearing them speak their own words express in various ways, now with gestures, now with smiles, now with open protests, their surprise, their wonderment, their suffering, etc., as will be seen forthwith. So it's this interesting sort of thought experiment of like, again, if a character had artistic control over how they were portrayed, what would that character think of the actor's training? If Hamlet or Antigone or uh, Nora had artistic control over performances of Hamlet or Antigone or A Doll's House, what would they say? What would they, how would they want to see their truth portrayed? 